Well, good afternoon. Um, I will call to order the December meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. Uh, so Paula, I guess we'll have a roll call. Or Kim, whoever's. Ellen Rodkey. Here. Israel Herrera. Here. Jim Whitlatch. Here. All right, and then first order of business is the consent calendar that we received uh, on Monday. Um, so the only thing we want to add to it is the payroll register for this for tomorrow, 12, 16, 22. Uh, so if there's no discussion, we can take a motion to approve the consent calendar. Move to approve the consent calendar. And a roll call vote. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right. Uh, consent calendar is approved. All right. So then we'll move on to section B here with awards and introductions. So I think Emily Buke is going to join us first. Hello, everyone. Um, there we go. Emily Boot, Community Relations Coordinator. Um, the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department would like to recognize John and Jennifer Vickers with the December Bravo Award. Uh, they are both loyal environmental stewards through their attendance at Weed Wrangles and as adopted green space volunteers. As adopted green space volunteers, they care for Winslow Woods Park, removing litter, fallen limbs, invasive species, and the like to help preserve the park for the public. They are also regular attendees at Weed Wrangles, where they have been learning how to identify and properly remove the top 10 invasive species in Monroe County. Uh, whenever they meet new volunteers or citizens during their efforts, they take the time to explain why they care about environmental stewardship and what they are doing to help preserve our green spaces for the future. Um, Jillian and I are both extremely grateful for their service to our parks and our department. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this isn't why we do what we do, and we really enjoy what we do. But um, yeah, we're really proud to live in a community that takes their public uh, spaces and, and green spaces so seriously. So thanks for your work. Th thanks for all of your service. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you. And is that picture of a Bloomington Park that you were there? <laughs> that's, that's a background I hadn't seen at any of our parks. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I know John from another uh, field, and it's great to see you here in a, in a different aspect, and, and congratulations for all this work that you have done together. So thank you very much. All right. All right. Thanks, Emily. So up next. Yeah, so on behalf of Julie, um, the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department would like to recognize TNT Pet Food and Supply as the recipient of the December Parks Partner Award. The Parks Partner Award is a component of the department sponsorship program and recognizes our most outstanding collaborators and supporters. Um, so for those of you who don't know, TNT Pet Food is a locally owned family-run business that has served the pets of Bloomington for nearly 50 years from their location on South Walnut. And they're really great partners to us. They sponsor, I think, every single one of our pet events, uh, maybe even one or two that really aren't related to pets. They respond right away. They always get their invoices in on time. Um, they're, just, they're just outstanding to work with. Um, we always know we can count on them. Uh, so we just want to recognize them for all they've done. Is anyone from TNT here right now? There's some faces I don't recognize. Um, Never mind. That's all then. Well, <laughs> thank you, TNT. Yeah, thank you, TNT, and thanks, Emily. <laughs> all right, so then we'll invite JP Ford up uh, to introduce himself as the new Banneker Program Specialist. Hello, yeah, like you said, I'm JP Ford. I'm the new program specialist at Banneker. I'm from Columbus, Indiana originally, and I've worked at Banneker as a rec leader and a building supervisor with our uh, after school programs at Banneker Camp. And my long term goals are expanding the visibility of the center within the community itself and also uh, increasing the accessibility of our events and programming for more people. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, JP. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and then Tim Street's gonna join us for a few uh, staff recognitions. 
Yes, just want to take a moment here at the end of the year to recognize a couple of longtime operations staff uh, that have retired or are retiring here in the tail end of the year. Uh, one of them is with us in person tonight, and I'm hoping the other is online. We'll, we'll find out in a few minutes. But uh, Denny Robertson's here with us tonight, back from retirement, hunting and working on his property and enjoying time in Montana, I'm sure. Um, Denny worked uh, for the city of Bloomington for 27 years, uh, which is a remarkably long time, including 21 years with Parks, uh, before he retired in September. Um, and, I, you know, I didn't get to overlap with Denny that much. I know Mark, Mark's here. Mark overlapped with Denny for six or seven years. Um, Denny was involved in countless projects. Uh, he was one of our main uh, MEOs, machine operators. And uh, in my time here, Denny um, was always up for any challenge, and he always knew someone in town, too, to like help borrow a piece of equipment or make something happen. So uh, I want to recognize Denny for his 27 years. Denny, do you want to do you want to say anything? No? All right. But well, we really appreciate you. Thanks for coming tonight, Denny. And then uh, the other staff member is Dave Fox, uh, who is our custodial superintendent, um, who will be retiring here at the end of the year. Um, he, I should say custodial working for person. He's also been our parks operations superintendent, along with a handful of other parks roles over his uh, more than 50 years with the parks department. Um, so he started with parks in March of 1972. Um, he retired once before, but it didn't stick, uh, like Michael Jordan, I told him last week. And he came back to us and has been working uh, as our custodial four person for the last few years um, and just doing an incredible job facing all of the challenges that our parks face in terms of cleanup. So, Kim, is Dave online in the participants there? Okay, Dave, Dave's not feeling well today, so unfortunately couldn't be here with us. But um, I mean, for Denny and Dave, a combined, I mean, that's an incredible 77, 78 years um, of devotion to the Parks Department and operations and uh, countless hours of uh, work and expertise. I just want to say we really appreciate them. Thanks. Congratulations, Denny and Dave, uh, even though you're not with us today. Uh, yeah, remarkable uh, years of service for sure. All right, so I think that brings us to our other business today. So first we'll hear from Paula McDevitt with a review and approval of the 2023 non-reverting budget. Thank you, good afternoon. Paula McDevitt, Director of the Department, and I am here for the annual task in December, and that is to present our 2023 non-reverting program budget. And this, uh, pending your review and approval, will set staff up ready to start a brand new year of programming and services for the community. So uh, the non-reverting program budget, uh, the recommendation is a due pass. Um, we are requesting $2,064,394. This, just as a little reminder, the non-reverting budget is an established enter enterprise fund. Uh, we use the zero base uh, budgeting model. Staff um, monitor, manage fees and charges, a lot of the fees and charges that you approved in the price schedule. Um, run through our non-reverting budget. Uh, this allows us a lot of flexibility to a, create new programs as things come along uh, during the year, um, but we can also ebb and flow, um, increase a need as we see fit and make those amendments in that budget. Um, and it also greatly reduces the reliance on the general fund tax base. So as you know, I presented the general fund 2023 budget uh, earlier this year, um, but it's really nice to have this secondary fund, um, especially with uh, being able to um, accommodate about $2 million in expenses. Um, and again, all staff are part of the budget building process from our program staff who are frontline, know what it takes to run these programs to our division directors and again, uh, finally presenting this to you. Um, I'll just briefly go through. This is set up the exact same way as our general fund budget with uh, four categories. So in category one, um, our personnel request uh, has an increase of almost $60,000, and that is attributed directly to our seasonal wages. As you know, we pay living wage, and uh, that increased again this year. Um, and so I've listed here the uh, ranges that we pay our staff. So seasonal, 
uh, staff earn 1529 all the way up to 1723, and then our specialist, um, we have a range in there as well. But as you know, we run a lot of seasonal staff through our non-reverting fund. Category two, supplies went up 37,478. And again, just like our general fund budget request, we saw an intense increase in the cost of goods and supplies this year. So uh, similar supplies, concessions runs through our non-reverting account, and again, program and event supplies. That's just with inflation, it's uh, hit both our general fund and our non-reverting budgets. Category three, we have an increase of 75,950. Again, mirroring our general fund uh, budget request, our utility costs. Um, as a reminder, the Twin Lakes Recreation Center revenue bond principal and interest payment comes out of non-reverting. Um, we have a few temp temporary contractual employees and then again, just the increase in costs for repairs and maintenance. So again, our total non-reverting request is 2,064,394, uh, about a 9.13% increase. And Kim, can you move the, the Zoom screen up out of that? Because that's, that's an important figure that I want you to see, which is our projected revenue. Oh, I think you have to do it with... Perfect, thank you. So um, while I'm presenting expenses, it's very important for you to see that we do have projected revenue of 1.7 million um, with our projected um, expenses a little over 2 million. Uh, we do present a budget that is not balanced and that is um, an annual occurrence because of our Twin Lakes Recreation Center um, bond principal and interest payment. I also am sharing our current non-reverting balance. Um, so you get that report every month in your board packet. So you see the expense and revenue and the balance that we carry. So because of the success of all of our combined non-reverting budgets, we are able to um, still make the Twin Lakes Recreation Center bond payment. So just showing you again a reminder, uh, we started the year, our non-reverting balance was 956,174. And in your report um, today, we have increased. We've uh, seen a revenue uptick, which is really nice. I did a quick look back. Um, and during COVID, uh, we actually lost um, about $707,000 in non-reverting revenue. Uh, uh, Difference. So we are seeing a rebound, which is um, very, very encouraging. And I anticipate with our successful programs and with our community continuing to participate, we'll see that revenue increase uh, next year. And that is the budget presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. A yeah, couple questions, questions, Paula. So I think you answered my question, some of my questions more or less at the end, but our Shortfall is 300,000 plus this year. Is that a smaller, sh that's a smaller shortfall than we've had in recent years? I yes, understand. yes. So we're and making- how, And so, and the, and the expenses went up nine point some percent. What did our, re what percentage did our revenue go up? I have to do some quick math and get back to you on that. that that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. Um, but as I, as I said, looking back over 20, 21 and 22, we are headed back in the right direction. Um, we, you know, back in the day, we carried about a $1.8, $1.9 million balance, and uh, we dipped almost to about $800,000 in, during COVID. So we're, we're inching back up there. So we're building up. Mm -hmm. And uh, without the revenue bonds, uh, historically, are our revenues over expenses? It's just the revenue bonds that have th throw us cause a shortfall? Yes, and uh, we bonded back in 2009 um, for about 6.2 million. Um, refinanced in 2017, we still owe about 3.1 million. So, and that bond will be paid off in 2029. So we're making nice progress, but again, it takes all of our non-reverting the success and the revenue that we bring in to, to make up that, that payment. Most of that revenue is from fees and things that mm -hmm. we do. So I know we approved fees at a prior meeting. 
do we, when we're looking at those fees, are we looking at what our expenses are and inflation and all those things? So we, and I know we did some of that when we looked at fees, we, mm -hmm. they were going up because of that, but do we have this kind of information so we make sure our fees keep up with our increase on expenses? Well, what I will tell you is um, staff work on their general fund budgets and their non-reverting budgets at the same time. It's a heavy lift for them and they all can nod their heads in that. Um, but they are doing that at the same time, so they're absolutely, they're seeing the increases and, and working on the budgets and taking that into consideration. And that all happens in the summer, September, and then we bring the fees and charges, but they're looking at fees and charges way back when they're building budgets, so it's all calculated in. Yeah. Well, that all looks good, especially with expenses going up mm -hmm. like they are, that we've made a dent or we're increasing that, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just add, if you look at things like concessions, you can see where how much they fell in 2020 and then how much more they're up since then because we actually have people in to buy things. Um, Israel, do you have any questions? Move to approve the uh, 2023 non-reverting budget. Okay. All right, so we'll take a roll call vote. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so next I think we will hear from Holly Warren uh, about the Rogers Family Park R contract. Hey everyone, my name is Holly Warren. I'm the Assistant Director for the Arts for the City of Bloomington. I'm here today to request an approval of an, a budget amendment to our contract for the Rogers Family Park Sculpture Fleeting by John Rasick. We're requesting a budget amendment to increase the budget from $25,000 to $32,844.50. Uh, so a little background. Um, so we've been working in partnership with Parks and the Rogers Family who's funding the overall all overhauling and rewilding of the Rogers Family Park space. We've also been working with the Bloomington Arts Commission to put a piece of public sculpture on that park. Um, we worked again with the family and the BAC to select Jonathan Rasick to put a sculpture on the park. Everybody's really happy with it. It's very beautiful, but from the time that we approved the original contract back to October to now, concrete prices have increased significantly. So that's where you're seeing most of the increase of this budget. The other additional budget that we're adding in now is to put some LED lights at the base of the sculpture at a couple of places to illuminate it so folks can see it better at night. Um, so that's what we're asking for. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the amendment. Uh, when I saw the increase, I figured it was concrete. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any questions. All right. All right, I move to approve the addendum to the contract for the Rogers Family Park Art Contract. And a uh, roll call vote. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right, motion carries. Great. Thank Thanks you so much, so. Holly. Appreciate it. All right, next up we have Sean Marler with a couple of items. Hi, Sean Marler, Switchyard Park General Manager. Uh, the first item, uh, staff would like to recommend for approval an addendum to the 2022 agreement to extend the scope of this agreement through 2023 at the same rate. This item is for Green Dragon Lawn Care. Uh, this year, Parks ex entered into this agreement in March 2022 to most specific areas at Switchyard Park with a not to exceed amount of 27,720. The total area they mow is 15.63 acres. Uh, they do about 26 to 30 cycles a year, depending on it. This is basically extending that contract through 2023 at the same rate. So their gas prices have gone up a little bit, but we're fortunate they offered to not increase their prices to us. Any questions I can? Do you know how much we actually paid them? And I know this is a not to exceed, but do you know we actually paid them for 20? I don't have that figure off the top of my head. I believe we did 28 cycles. Okay. So. This starts in, they usually start mowing in April, is that? Yeah, so it's, it's always a little tricky. It depends on weather, but roughly April, yes. Okay. Other questions? Yes, yes. That's I'm just curious when you say that staff is satisfied with, with the work. 
So I'm just wondering when the staff is. This uh, year? Was, no, oh, this sorry. year you are satisfied. The staff is satisfied, but when it's not a satisfactory work, what is, what implies? There are things built into the contract uh, that talks about certain criteria they have to meet so that we can hold them accountable to the contract. And although this is be extended for 2023, for the following year, it will be open for bid again. So there's always the chance if they do a bad job that we can find a different vendor in the future. Green Dragon is also a vendor that ops uh, landscaping uh, uses for other parks. Uh, they've been a good vendor for a number of years uh, for the Parks Department. Yeah. All right. Move that we approve the contract addendum with Green Dragon Lawn Care for Switchyard Park. Second. All right, and a roll call vote. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. I think y'all stand with us for one more item. All right, the second item is a similar item. Uh, it is for a preventative maintenance contract with Harold Fish Incorporated. Uh, staff recommends approval of this addendum for the 2022 agreement to extend in scope and price through the 2023 season. Uh, parks entered into this agreement this current year uh, for ma preventative maintenance at Switchyard Park. This includes backflow inspections, main performance stage electrical, plumbing, uh, pavilion HVAC electrical and plumbing, spray pad pump and filter systems uh, related to the spray pad operations and the purchase of spray pad filters. This has a not to exceed amount of 17,572. Uh, and again, this is the same type of item where it basically takes our existing contract and extends the scope and price for another year uh, we were fortunate that HFI also said that they would keep the same pricing. That's great. And I know that the uh, spray pad, when we first got it, was seemed like a word. It was a lot. And so they seem to, they know what they're doing. They, you feel like they have it really dialed in. They do. The, out there. The, okay. the two critical times of the spray pad are the startup and the close down. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need their help the most. Uh, mm -hmm. Other than that, it's just a few preventative maintenance things. But those specific time periods are when we really uh, need a lot of their help. Okay. And they've been great. The spray pad is a hugely popular uh, amenity, possibly the most popular amenity at the park during the summer. So having their help to make sure it runs well, we have very, especially this year, we had very minimal shutdowns, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is great. So. Yeah, it's good to hear. No questions, thank you. Uh, move to approve the contract with Harold Fish for preventative maintenance at Switchyard Park. Second. All right, and a roll call vote. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim, Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. All right, next up we'll hear from Satoshi Kido with a golf cart lease agreement. Satoshi Kido from Sports. Uh, current agreement that we have, lease agreement, a golf cart at the Cascade is expiring uh, next spring. and. Uh, Back in September, we went, went through the whole bidding process and uh, two company bids. And uh, easy go, uh, current bid was high and uh, Midwest tough and golf. Uh, that was uh, low and uh, new company we'd like to recommend. Yeah, so I'm just curious, can you tell us a little bit, I might just not be as familiar with our agreement in general. So do we, is this, um, this is a four or five year lease agreement with the option to purchase the golf carts, is that? That is correct. That's okay. a little bit confusing, but the lease agreement we have uh, at the end of the agreement, we own the cart. Okay. And we can get into trade-in for okay. the upcoming lease. Okay, and did we contract with Midwest in the past or this is a brand new? This is a new company. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's a significant savings. Who, who was the contract with before? Easy Go. Oh, okay. Easy Go was. And uh, I'm just curious, it's, there's such a difference in the bids. Why is there such, it's, I mean, one bid is twice as much as the other, and obviously the 
if they're apples to apples, which they must be, we'd want to go with the smaller one. But can you, do you know why it's so different? Uh, nationwide, it's a shortage. Golf cart shortage is going on right now. Okay. And the golf business is booming. And uh, easy goes nationwide. And this small company is based on Indiana. So they had the inventory that they could do it, and EasyGo basically said, if we're going to do it, you're going to pay this much. Plenty of business. We don't need to cut our costs. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So the new, the new contract would be in four years, so we will be working with uh, Midwest Golf and Turf for four or five years, and then the bids come again. Correct. Other questions? Okay. I move for approval of the golf cart lease agreement with Midwest Golf and Turf Club Car. Second. All right. And a roll call vote. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Thank Thanks, you. Keto. All right. Next up, we'll hear from Haskell Smith, the service agreement with Bluestone Tree. Hello, everybody. Uh, staff recommends the approval of service agreement with Bluestone Tree for the removal of hazard trees pruning or hazard reduction pruning in the amount not to exceed $18,000. Uh, a little bit of background, there was approximately 250 trees removed around the city of Bloomington last year, or this year, I should say. Several of these were hazard trees along property lines and right-of-ways and in areas beyond what the scope of urban forestry staff can safely and expediently mitigate. Having the service agreement allows for time-sensitive hazards, trees, and limbs to be removed before causing any undue harm or property damage. And is that a lot of trees compared to how many we've it's removed a, in the past? I feel like it's about average. Okay, okay. Uh, some years with the EAB wave that we had, the prior years were much higher, but we're kind of seeing the tail off now. Okay, yeah, that's good. How do you assess that something's a hazard? Is, is somebody driving around or do you record? We, uh... I get you reports and respond that way. I do spend a lot of time in the field keeping my eyes peeled. I am ISA risk assessment certified or qualified, I should say. But yeah, I try to treat everything with an open mind walking in. But some things stand out more than others. And in certain areas, Bluestone's got the crane that I can't get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No question. No question. Okay. Move that we approve the service agreement with Bluestone Tree LLC for tree removals and pruning services. Second. All right. And a roll call vote. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right. Thanks, Haskell. Thank motion. You. I guess that's just a motion carries. <laughs> All right. Tim Street. Here All right. Good evening. Us. Yeah. Good evening, sorry. Good evening, Commissioners. Tim Street, Operations and Development Division Director for Bloomington Parks. Uh, first item I have up for review here is a review of an approval of a memorandum of understanding with Duke Energy for their reliability project phase two. Uh, so we recommend approval of this MOU, um, which is for this upcoming project that will con connect transmission lines uh, between the substation on Rogers Street, just west of Switchyard Park. Um, up to the substation that is just north of uh, Rogers and Fairview Streets, uh, northwest of where we are here in City Hall. Um, so I haven't been with the city that long, but I understand this has been a project that has long been in negotiation uh, to improve reliability of electric service in Bloomington, uh, decrease outages. Uh, it will involve the installation of a transmission line between those two substations. Uh, as a result, and the, the reason Parks is particularly involved with this, um, it will result in, we believe, 126 city-owned trees being removed um, as part of the construction of this new line. Um, as such, Duke has agreed to compensate the city $49,000 for the loss of these trees, um, which will be used for street trees going back with a priority going back in those locations um, where the work has to be done. Um, this MOU is actually jointly approved also by the Board of Public Works because it deals with right-of-way issues uh, and access, and we do anticipate that some work will be along the B-Line Trail uh, and may result in some disruptions to service on the B-Line later next year, which uh, we would uh, anticipate uh, bringing that policy we reviewed last month back to the board soon and reviewing that so we have a clearer picture of that moving forward. Uh, 
Yeah, I think uh, that's pretty straightforward. I, the 49000 is that, did we provide them with an estimate of the cost of replacement on those trees? We did, um, and that was actually uh, with Erin Hatch when she was still with the city. Uh, she worked with Duke to identify which trees were coming out, identified which ones were high value and which ones were maybe undesirable in the first place, and assigned values to those based on their diameter of breast height. Okay. And that's how we arrived at that figure. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. How are we planning on replacing those? Is that who, who falls? Whose jurisdiction does that fall under? Uh, it would fall under the Urban Forestry Department, um, certainly. And whether or not we would approach that with an in-house perspective or a contract perspective is yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions of that? No. All right. Move that we approve the MOU with Duke Energy for reliability project. Second. Uh, and a roll call vote. Ellen Rodkey? Aye. Israel Herrera? Aye. Jim Whitlatch? Aye. All right, motion carries. Thanks for that one, Tim, and then we'll hear about Marshall Security. Yes, so staff recommends approval of a contract with Marshall Security to provide security services in parks and on trails in 2023. Uh, the contract total is uh, $297,840. Uh, and the funding source is actually split between our operations uh, account and our switchyard account. Uh, so 2022 was the first full year uh, that parks relied on Marshall Security to provide security services both in Switchyard Park and in core downtown parks and along the B-Line. Um, overall, we have been very pleased with their service um, and their incident reporting and the level of support they've given to our staff and to security efforts. Um, we've been able to work with them throughout the course of the year on improving that service and refining it, and we, we believe we've made some good, uh, good changes for next year as well um, to just make our service a little more efficient um, while still maintaining uh, a high level of safety and security for park and trail users. Um, this will include security patrols for every day of the year next year except for a few uh, specific holidays and uh, it does give us flexibility that as needs arise or change or different things pop up in different locations, um, we do have a little bit of flexibility in to, to work with the marshal staff, the admin staff, um, to flex and change some of those hours and locations throughout the year. I'm just curious on those holidays, do we rely on uh, city police uh, just to help monitor parks and, um I mean, those days. Yeah, that... and, and you know, in general, absolutely, we still rely on yeah. Bloomington Police Department in, in general, too, on those days. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's only like three holidays, though, isn't it? Yeah. There were only three that we identified, yeah. yes. Christmas. Christmas, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So regarding the summer adjustments for the locations, what would be those changes? What, what changes did we make in 2023 versus last year? Uh, we took a little more holistic approach to our security patrols between Switchyard and the rest of parks in the B-Line. In 2022, we, we basically operated those almost as completely separate patrols. Um, and in next year, in talking with, with Sean and the rec staff, uh, we've decided to, to combine a little bit of that to make it a little more efficient. Um, overall, the locations that are being patrolled and the hours that are being patrolled are, are still generally the same and are being covered very similarly as they were in 2022. Move we approve the contract for 2023 contract with Marshall Security for security services at various park properties. All right, and a roll call vote, Paula. Alan Rotke. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thanks, Tim. So that concludes this portion of the agenda. So we'll move on to our reports and Tim will stick with us to introduce the presentation about the gateway. That's right. So I'm just gonna give a little background on the project and I've presented on this before and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Rundell Ernstberger and Associates that are here with us this evening. Uh, in 2018, the city issued the series of bicentennial bonds, uh, and in that was included $1.25 million for the development and installation of gateways uh, around different locations in Bloomington. Um, initial designs were pursued uh, in 2018, 2019. There was even public meetings. Um, various locations were, were assessed and some designs were created uh, before COVID kind of brought the project to a halt. 
Um, earlier this year, at the start of this year, um, we introduced a contract addendum to the park board. I believe Paula presented that to you all and was approved um, for REA to update these concepts to, to relaunch the project uh, with an eye on two key locations uh, for the final gateways, one of them being the 46 Highway 46 pedestrian bridge uh, on the northwest side of town, close to 69. Uh, and the other being the, the northern tip of Miller Showers Park. Um, so we have received uh, schematic design concepts from REA and Kevin Sweetland, and uh, I don't know if Kevin Osborne is gonna speak at all, but Kevin Sweetland's gonna speak tonight um, and talk about those concepts. Uh, additionally, we will be launching uh, a public meeting right after this tonight to share those concepts, uh, and they will be available online for public comment for a few weeks. And I believe uh, Julie Ramey, our community relations director, uh, has a press release ready to go out after tonight um, with those details, so that can be shared again with the public. Thanks, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Tim. Good evening, my name's Kevin Sweetland. I'm a designer with Rundle Ernstberg Associates, and I'm gonna talk about Bloomington Gateways. Uh, can I change the slides from up here, or do I have to? Okay, okay. All right, well then, go ahead and advance. Oh, there we go. All right, so we have uh, two, two primary sites, uh, the North Gateway, which is at the north end of Miller Showers Park. There's a triangular, triangular area there just north of the park. Uh, that's the site for the North Gateway, and then the Arlington, Arlington Ped Bridge, which is on the bypass um, near Arlington uh, Elementary School. And anyways, then we're gonna talk about some of the plant selections. So this is the North Gateway. You can go ahead and flip to the next slide, Paula. All right, there, outlined in white, go ahead and flip to the next one. We're gonna get through these pretty quick. Just a few labels here to talk about where we are. So we're between College Avenue and Walnut. Um, we're looking south from basically the bypass towards Miller Showers Park, and our area is there, that triangular piece just north of the park. Here is the uh, existing site. Um, you see it's pretty, um, um, uh, empty at the moment, it's basically just a lawn. There are a few trees at the north end of the uh, triangle. These are pear trees that are an invasive species, so part of the project will be removing those. Um, go ahead and advance to the next one, Paula. We'll talk about the proposed plan. Um, so like I said uh, before, we'll be removing the trees from the northern part of the uh, triangle, adding new street trees along uh, two sidewalks that we're extending from Miller Showers Park up to uh, a landscaped area, area where we're placing the main gateway um, um, element, which we'll see here in the next slides. But uh, another key thing here to note about this plan is that we would be um, rebuilding the uh, traffic island uh, kind of to the right side of the plan, uh, the south side of the plan, um, basically to accommodate that, that new sidewalk um, and to take care of some uh, broken curb and other things that are um, defective with the existing traffic island. Go ahead and advance, Paula. So here we have the perspective looking at the main gateway element, which is this large core 10 steel monolith. Um, go ahead and flip to the next slide. Paula will highlight some of the uh, elements and materials here. Um, the main material uh, is core 10 steel, which is kind of this rusted steel material. It's um, intended to sort of weather and uh, get this sort of, uh, this patina, which is really uh, charming in certain contexts. Um, it's also meant to um, build on this concept that we developed during the master plan, which was um, this idea of these landscapes in Bloomington being um, symbols of the city's resiliency, uh, the city moving from sort of an industrial uh, manufacturing sort of town into something new, which is focused on sustainability in the future. Um, so at the base of the, um, the monolith, if you flip to the next slide, uh, Paula, we have these limestone pieces, uh, sort of rough cut limestone uh, blocks, meant to replicate um, uh, limestone spoils, these piles of limestone you'll find in different landscapes around Bloomington where we have uh, the natural landscape starting to grow up within the gaps between those stones. It's kind of a, um, a relic of the past sort of situated here and composed, so to kind of just build on that unique character and the unique history of this particular place. Uh, so if you go back, uh, Paula will talk about the monolith in a little bit more detail. Um, so the Core 10 steel uh, monolith hosts obviously the, uh, the, the, the name of the town, Bloomington. Uh, it's set um, in front of a perforated Core 10 steel panel. It's perforated so that the 
monolith can be lit internally and then shine at night. We'll show an image of that in a little bit. But there's a lot of interesting things we can do with this material, with the perforations. Uh, the letters themselves would be uh, a polished aluminum, um, which would stand out on this, this uh, Corten steel backdrop. So if you go ahead and advance a couple slides here, Paula, we'll look at a night scene of the, uh, the landmark. So you can see here with the lighting within the, 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 um, the monolith, it really strikes a, uh, a, stunning, a stunning image as you approach town from the north side. The second site is the Arlington Ped Bridge. Uh, here we're hovering above the bypass looking east on the north side of town. That's the bridge there in the center. On the left is Arlington Elementary School and on the right, uh, existing neighborhoods. Go ahead and flip to the next slide, Paula. Uh, here we can see the site and plan. Nothing too much uh, here. It's really just the ped bridge connecting the neighborhood and the school with the bypass running underneath. Go ahead and flip to the next slide, Paula. And the plan is, is fairly simple. We're proposing some landscaping at either end of the, uh, the bridge to kind of bookend the uh, sign we would like to add to the existing chain link structure um, across the bypass. We're somewhat limited in our landscaping options based on NDOT and the requirements to keep a clear zone on either side of the interstate. Um, so this plan and the actual sizing and placement of trees will depend on their input. Um, but this is, this is getting pretty close to what the final design might look like. Um, a few other landscape elements, uh, we're proposing some limestone boulders at the foot of the bridge where the intermediate structure uh, legs come down and touch the hillside. Um, also some stone below the actual bridge there on the slope uh, where we won't be able to grow plants. Go ahead and flip to the next slide, Paula. So the sign itself would be um, affixed to the existing chain link structure. Uh, these letters would have some uh, depth to them. There would basically be a, a box on the inside of the structure which would house your lighting and other uh, electrical elements um, with a coarse 10 steel plate on the outside of the uh, chain link. And all this would sort of be sandwiched together to secure itself to the chain link fence. Uh, the sign there, or the uh, picture on the lower left is an example of a very similar sort of sign uh, in northern Indiana. Go ahead and flip to the next slide, Paula. So this is what it would look like at night. So we'd have these Corten steel pla plates outlined by uh, thin ribbons of light around uh, the letters to make them visible at night. Not too glaring, but um, a really nice effect. So with that, I'll start I'll talk a little bit about the planting. Go ahead and flip to the next slide, Paula. Uh-oh. <laughs> In a moment. OK, uh, well, I mean, for the planting design, it's uh, the main point is the planting design will be 100% native plants native to this part of Indiana. Um, a variety of trees, shade trees, ornamentals, and a few uh, coniferous species, um, and then a variety of grasses, shrubs, and perennials. So all things that the local fauna will enjoy. The particulars are not that important. There, there is a, an entire sort of list of the plants we're using, but questions, I guess? Got a couple questions that uh, Corten steel, I think mm -hmm. you call it. Um, yeah. And so how, the patina on that, how does it age? Does it, when you put it up, is it a uh, look like steel and then over the next year it turns that kind of reddish color? No, it, it generally starts out of, the, out of the box, if you will, kind of that, 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 that okay. finish. So it doesn't change too much over time. Okay. Um, so it's not like, uh, I guess, Sometimes I've seen or roofs that start out and then right. they change over time to that reddish and it's, you know, at first you think it's just rusting away and then it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, there shouldn't be any surprises with okay. it, you know. You should, yeah. Okay. And then my other question is on the Arlington Pedestrian Bridge. Um, I don't pay much attention to that, but that bridge has been there for a long time and I have no idea how well it's maintained or how, what shape the fencing is, mm -hmm. so I guess 
have we analyzed that? And I don't want to put something up there that we yes. end up well, having that, to replace. Well, this will be part of the whole process. So we're okay. at schematic design right now. So this next phase, design development and construction documents will begin to engage a structural engineer. We've been working with NDOT to get the actual sort of as-built drawings for the bridge, which we have now, which we can then use to get that structural analysis done so that we don't put anything up that's going to fall down. Also, in order for NDOT to permit this work, they need to see that documentation from a yeah. structural engineer in order to even do this. So okay. we'll have to check those boxes as we go. Okay. So, but the, and that'll, part of that'll be how, what, how good a condition is the bridge in? Uh, are we, is part of this project replacing the fencing or is it just? Not at the moment, um, the moment. but as okay. we move forward, you it, might find you know, that we that might have to make decisions. Okay. So. All right. Thanks. I'm guessing that fencing is probably not, that's public works or tra transportations uh, under there. Yeah, oh, it is, okay. Yeah, so the, the, ro the road Because it goes over a state road, okay. Yes, and, I gotcha. and yeah, they own the bridge and, and the road, and um, yes, so, and that's okay. the primary. Person. And can they decide at some point, just like, no, we're not doing any of that? Can they tell us no at all? No, we're not putting anything on there? <laughs> I mean, if, if the structural analysis comes back right. and they're not pleased, I, I suppose yes. Okay. Um, but at this moment, they're they're willing. We're to, keeping uh, them in the loop. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, it's a yeah. good working relationship at the moment. So. Good. Yeah. At one point, we talked about, and I know we aren't anymore, but we've talked about other entrances. We decided that budgetarily, that these are the main and these are the interests. We only have enough to do two of them. Is that right? Correct. Right. Okay. One, uh, this one, Arlington pedestrian bridge would be just one side, right? Would be one side, not two sides. Yes, for this particular, um, yeah, it would be facing west. So as you come in from, to town from 69, from that re direction, you'll see this on the way back. It'll be, you know, be facing the other direction. So just, just one side. Just, just to, uh, as a refresher, the different in, in the lighting between the one in Walnut and this one would be... The difference in the lighting? Yeah. Um, it would be a lot of similarities. I mean, both are sort of internally lit. Um, this would be shining th through probably some sort of acrylic panel that would keep everything enclosed, uh, whereas the other one uh, will be shining through perforated Corten steel. Um, but yeah, the, the lighting, um, it's real differences of scale. Um, I think both, if, if the city would like, you know, could be these color changing LEDs, which wouldn't change from moment to moment, but you could program it for like, if it's, you know, Valentine's Day, you could have yeah. it be red or, you know, something like that, if, thematic like that. If there is a special event or a national event, so the colors could be changed to the... That's a real possibility, yeah. And yeah. who would be in charge of putting those colors or deciding that, uh, that would be representative of a local or national event? Mm. I'm sorry, you, who, would, who would decide for yeah. those? Oh, I, I may imagine that would be um, either parks or other city officials. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and they do that from time to time on the BT um, building. Um, and that um, for special events and that we've done it at Switchyard Park outside the pavilion. So it's really depending upon what it is that, that we're celebrating or want, or want to highlight who would make that. But the controls for doing that would be with yeah, us. Right. With the Parks Department. Right. Okay. Maybe in 2026 with the World Cup in USA, we might have the, you know, the colors <laughs> of the flag. <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, we, if you want to flip to the slides, we can, we can look at them there. Um, there's nothing I would say that's very surprising, but yeah, you see some of the trees here um, that we're looking at. Honey, look, uh, yeah, the linden, the, um, some shrubs, our, our grasses mm -hmm. and shrubs. And go ahead and flip to the next one, and we've got more color on the next one. And uh, a variety of different perennials um, that really will add a lot of uh, color and interest to these landscapes throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So. No more Bradford right. pears. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you so you. much, Kevin. Thank you.
So I'll just, just add for the public aspect, we will be in the atrium at 6 p.m. Okay. to 7 p.m. and then it'll be available online afterwards. And in addition to feedback tonight, we're also working with other city departments, planning and transportation, engineering, making sure we look at all the other aspects um, as well as the Bloomington Arts Council. So thank and you to REA. What can we expect next, Tim, after the public comment period? Uh, so public comment's gonna go through early January, mm -hmm. uh, at which point we're gonna return the feedback uh, to REA, compile and return the feedback. Uh, and then as Kevin mentioned, we'll be moving into that next phase of design um, where we start to work on construction documents the early part of 2023 uh, to work towards uh, hopefully a bid. Okay. Yep. Wow, sounds thanks. good. All right, thanks. All right, so that wraps up that portion. I think our only remaining business would be if there's any public comment. So I don't know if there's anyone in the Zoom room or um, If there's present. anyone who is attending um, virtually, if you'd like to use the raised hand feature for public comment. Seeing none. Okay, great. So then, if, is there anything else, Paula, you have to close this out? Monitor. I know. <laughs> well, um, the only announcement I have is um, we'll be starting again January 24th. It's the first meeting of the new year. And um, if Kim hasn't already sent you the meeting calendar, she will. And just on behalf of the staff, we'd like to thank all the Board of Park Commissioners for your loyal support, the good conversation, the great questions, and uh, everything that you do to support the work that we do. And thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you to thank your you. staff for a great year. Happy and holidays. Happy holidays, yeah, happy everyone. Happy holidays, and I'll adjourn the December meeting of the Board of Park Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Well, no problem.